one of the one of the real core <coughs> conceptual backgrounds in understanding uh, stream ecosystems is a river continuum concept. And the nice thing about this is that it puts everything together from the basic physical characteristics all the way up to the fish, right? It, it's a very comprehensive view of the way systems work. And it has this idea of ecosystems as linked to each other and sources and subsidies of materials and how they link with each other. So it puts all these things together into this big concept of, of how systems work. So we start at first order streams and go down to say 10th order streams, you know, Missouri River or something like that, or large river. And we think about the channel width. The channel width is going to increase substantially. And channel width actually increases more than depth does as you move downstream. So the streams really tend to get wider as they get larger, more than they get deeper. Even though they do get deeper, the, the width to depth ratio increases as you move downstream. Okay, so when we, when we do that, and, and this, system, this, this, this idea is based on a, a deciduous forest stream. So it has these deciduous forests here that cover, the canopy covers in these first and second order streams. And then it starts, to, the stream gets wide enough that it doesn't matter that there's canopy there because the light can get in anyway. And we go from a very net heterotrophic, right, aloxanous, driven system to a more autochthonous system. And when they drew this, they had P to R being less than one here and P to R being greater than one here. Now we know that, that, photo, that GPP is less than respiration, but not as much. The balance is, is not changed as much. As we move downstream, <coughs> we might get more and more suspended materials and eventually light might become limiting because of the sediments and stuff that build up in these large rivers. So if you go to the Mississippi River, it's got a lot of sediment in it. You know, the mighty, muddy Mississippi um, has always been that way as, as far as historical accounts go. And you might have areas that they're clear where there's phytoplankton start to develop because you don't have so much washing out. Um, but you might also just have a system that's totally driven by carbon inputs from above. And so you think about these primary food sources, and here upstream we have leaves sort of driving everything. But as we move downstream, the leaves become less important, and the organic <coughs> carbon washing in from above and particulate and dissolved materials becomes, assumes an ever greater importance. Whereas you get to something like even the Kansas River, it's, it's, they're still getting some leaf and wood input, but something bigger like the Missouri River it's just less consequential. And this, what's washing down in these fine particulate materials is what's really driving the system. Okay, so then you can look at the macroinvertebrate community, invertebrate communities, and we see that high up in the system, these shredders are quite important and things that are going collecting particles are quite important. Grazers aren't, you know, real, real dominant because there's not a lot of algae growing. It's just dark, the stream's covered a lot of the time. And then as we move downstream, the grazers take on an increasing importance because the particulate materials are coming out from these organisms and, and the system and moving downstream. The collectors become even more important. The shredders become less important and the predators still have their, are there. And then we move down to the biggest rivers and it's almost all dominated by collectors, almost no shredders. The grazers, if it if are out, if there's not much light getting to the bottom. And you might have some zooplankton starting to come up. You might actually have water slowing enough, and a slow enough flushing rates that it becomes more like a lake and you have suspended materials that can stay in the system. Particularly, this would be the case if you have things like oxbows and side channels where, with, when we talked about the flood pulse concept, where there are these dead zones of still water that, and then you can get phytoplankton and zooplankton really, really um, developing well. Um, and then on top of this, we have the fish communities. And so we perhaps, in these smallest streams, we have things that are adapted. To, they have to be small because it's physically small habitat. <coughs> things perhaps are adapted to more benthic lifestyle, you know, stick, being on the bottom, sculpins and saying some of the trout streams, some of the darters and those things that we have in, in our, our small streams. Um, 
maybe some organisms like the creek chubs that would depend fairly heavily upon terrestrial insect inputs as well because they're so so intertwined with the terrestrial system so things here like creek chubs and smaller streams in the Rockies or in the East Coast we might have small trout for example that are using um, using the terrestrial insect and as we move down we get a larger fish we can get into some some predatory fish oftentimes some sight feeders and then as we move further we get things like these catfish and paddlefish great teaching tool because it allows you to think about how these ecosystems work how the adaptations of the organisms tune them into the different parts and the idea that river systems are, are networks of systems they're not just occurring in isolation and I think that's one of the big contributions that stream ecologists and river ecologists in general have given to ecology the idea of looking at whole watersheds and looking at a holistic approach to the ecological systems and, it, and it's, it's, uh, it's an important one. So, so <coughs> some assumptions that I made here about the biome, how might you think this would vary in different biomes? Like in, I don't know, in Kansas it seems like we don't have a lot of closed canopy like headwater streams, so it'd yeah. be a little different. Yeah, more exactly. Dependent on, like, so these would be grasslands, right? Yeah. These would be open canopy, and then the closed canopy might happen further down. Well, think about some others. Let, let's talk about, say, the mountains. What what what's the dominant um, vegetation there? Rocks, maybe not. But let's say, let's not get all the way up into into above timberline, but below timberline. It would all be closed canopy. It'd be closed canopy, but what what types of trees would dominate? Conifers. Pine, right? Pine trees, evergreens, right? So you'd expect them to have less leaf input because they don't lose their leaves every year, right? And so so there might be less less shredders there because the leaf material that's coming in isn't quite so so dominant. And now what about above tenderloin or arctic systems? Yeah, again, it's open, so you'd expect there to be not some, maybe product in channel primary production <coughs> more important. Right? So you can use this idea, it doesn't necessarily apply to all the systems that there are, um, but it, you can use it to sort of organize your thoughts. And then you can think of a stream like this as small, Sometimes you know just goes right into a big river, and so you don't have the whole continuum there, but it's still the ideas sort of work. But then you get this sort of juxtaposition of this type of community right next to this type of community, which is part of the reason why when the floods come and flush stuff out, the catfish go towards those little streams and get the, the um, material, the organisms that are coming out that aren't adapted to dealing with those particular systems. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Did the authors for this, did they actually do a study or did they compile, compile a bunch of studies and then bring this concept? Yeah, so the concept um, happened um, in, at Stroud Water Research and they were having a meeting, uh, a conceptual meeting, and uh, they, um, Robin Bonneau came up with this idea and they all developed it from con concepts. And uh, they were real excited about it, and so they hopped in their car, part of them hopped in the car and ran down to Washington, D.C. and got funded to do the research to actually test it. Then they went out and did a series of experiments in Oregon, um, Idaho, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, I believe, and tested the ideas of this. And many of the predictions did match the, the theory that came out. They didn't, they didn't entitle it, they just entitled it, the original paper was entitled the Con River Continuum Concept, right? So they didn't say it was a theory or a law, uh, but a general concept. Uh, it's, it's generated a lot of research and a lot of citations since then. And everybody that teaches this class uses, uses it as well if they have streams in there um, for that reason. But yeah, it was first an idea. So if you have a bright idea, try to follow it through. I guess that's the moral of that story.
part of the lex last lecture was talking about the river continuum concept. And we started discussing having various biomes and how they might fall into the river continuum concept. And I just wanted to go through a little bit more detailed exposition of that with respect to prairie streams. And this is from a paper that I did with some colleagues on how our view of the of prairie streams has developed relative to the river continuum concept. And as you did suggest in, in our earlier discussion, because you have grasslands upstream, you're going to have more light and less leaf litter coming in up there. So, so there's something that's fundamentally different from the basic ideas that were presented in the original paper. So if we go from first order to larger streams, we see that we have quite a few um, small floods uh, on, at the top. And then hydrologically, because grasslands are drier systems anyway, that's why the trees don't develop and take over, is that there's at least times of year where it's dry enough that you can have fire to knock the trees down. Uh, we have intermittence in these higher areas. That is, it doesn't flow as consistently. Although in, in Kanza, because it's a car system, we actually have some springs. So there could be some springs or temporary areas that flow at time. As we move downstream, the intensity of the floods goes up uh, because you have a larger watershed area to collect. And on Kanza, again, the example is that, that you know, at the bottom of that watershed of King's Creek, you can have a 20-foot wall of water come down. And it really completely moves everything around. You just can't generate that much water up high in the watershed because there's not much, that much area to, to collect it, even with a, you know, five-inch rainstorm on top of wet soil. So there can be some very intense disturbance from floods down, but the drawing is going to be sort of the overarching <coughs> biological effect when you, when you go up higher. And you can see then that you can, you can suspect that you'd have, if you have really high flooding, you're going to get lower diversity after that flooding, particularly the macroinvertebrates that are left. Um, but following drying, um, there's relatively high diversity because the top dries, but the bottom, you could even concentrate organisms. They may use it as a refuge. And then if we think about the photosynthesis respiration, P to R um, is actually less than, P is less than R, much less than R down here. After we've done the actual, actual measurements, we never see uh, gross primary production being exactly equal to R. That is net ecosystem production being much greater than zero, except for maybe intermittently. And then the other thing that, that happens is that you have this translating differently because the grass leaves don't get into the stream channel. And so you don't really have many shredders up high. You don't have many invertebrates that live on that leaf material. Those would be tapulids and, and uh, some of the other organisms like that. But because the canopy is open and you do have a substantial amount of algae, you'll have a lot of grazers. So you'll have scrapers that are out there, mayflies, snails, those kinds of things that, that eat a lot, of this, uh, a lot of the algae. In the intermittent, in the intermediate areas, then we start getting shrubs and, and more canopy cover and more leaf material. And we see that the shredders can come up as you move downstream. And so at this time of year, um, there might be quite, quite a bit of leaf material in that system, a lot of food available for organisms that use leaves as a primary energy source. And then when we, the other thing that we have is this idea that um, we talked about habitats that are intermittent with drying and the, the adaptations that organisms need to have to get in into those particular habitats. That, that was a question on the last exam, actually. And we know that things need to be able to either withstand drying or be able to move into a system very quickly and reproduce. So we have these fishes that are able to swim. And as the stream wets, they actually swim up into the area. The crayfishes burrow into the banks. And then there's a lot of drift coming downstream of macroinvertebrates that, that, that sort of have this refuge up in these pools. And then they move down into the system as it flows. 
uh, usually during the spring time. And you may remember when we talked about the index of harshness habitat that, that Ken Fritz did the work on the macroinvertebrates. And he showed that the further away you get from these sources of colonization and the longer the dry period is and the more intense the flood is and the more recent the dry period or flood is, the harsher the environment and the lower diversity is. So you see this, this response of gradual increase in diversity and then it gets knocked back again and again. And every year, you know, you wonder about this because you have these massive fish populations. They move up, and a lot of them, they reproduce, but a lot of them get stranded in the pools as it dries back down again. And the raccoons and the herons just come in and, you know, scoop that stuff up, and then it repeats itself. So these fish species actually have uh, a life history of trying to exploit habitats that are temporary, and they pay a price for it, but it keeps them in the system, essentially. Perhaps they're not as able to compete as well down here if they just stayed here until they can reproduce enough and enough of them can get back down again. And then the inver invertebrates have you know, the additional uh, luxury of having aerial life forms, so they can actually fly from water, sub watershed to wa sub watershed when they reproduce and lay their eggs, or fly downstream or fly upstream. So they don't have, they're not confined to the stream channel. So that they have slightly different patterns as they come in. And some of the organisms are extraordinarily opportunistic. You know, so for example, water striders, um, they're just they're, they're adult insects and they can fly around and they just find any temporary pool of water that has food on it and land on it and take advantage of it. So you can just see those come in almost immediately. So this then is also it, it, interesting and exciting to me because it illustrates the idea that you can go from geomorphology to ecosystem rates to the effect of the external biota on the biota in the streams and then it influences the biodiversity. And then this grant that we're working on now is how that biodiversity then feeds back onto the actual ecosystem rates. <coughs> And then if you want to add in the cattle, how the diversity, or the bison, how the diversity feeds back to the geomorphology even. And things like what, what the balance of trees and grass is up in the upper levels. So this comprehensive view that I talked about, the idea that I talked about very early on in the class. I, I, I mentioned to you the reason why I took this class. It's my favorite class to teach. And when I took it, it was, it was a revelation to me because you know, I'd had chemistry, I'd had some ecology, I'd had, you know, biology, different aspects of biology, yet all of a sudden all these things were coming together and understanding the way the world actually worked. And so for, for me, I'm, I'm a part of what I'm trying to do in this class and why I'm talking about this ecosystem stuff and this comprehensive stuff at the end is give you a sense of that and hope that, some, that you take some of that with you 